benefit of all the R&D, all the research and development that had been done by non-relatives for a long period. You think about it, when, when that first eukaryotic union happened, you have two relatively independent entities. They have evolved for a million years in slightly different environments. When they come together, they get the benefit of a billion years of R&D in, in a twinkling. They don't have to do it for themselves. Of course, if A takes B apart, all bets are off. It's throwing away all that design work and just using the energy, just using the raw materials. Similarly, when we invented, when, when culture was invented, and we really didn't invent it, when language evolved, suddenly individuals could acquire stupendous amounts of design that they didn't have to do themselves the hard way. It was the great influx of design which set off the cultural revolution. Now, tradition maybe would say that culture is a divine gift. Different, different religions have different stories about how, how human beings got language or culture. Another story, slowly, slightly less mythical, is that it's all the product of human genius. You know, who, who invented language? Well, there was this really clever woman way back when she invented language. Her brother invented the wheel, and you know, no, 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 we know that that's not true. But it leads to the view that over the centuries, intelligent human designers created cultural treasures which were then valued and preserved and passed on. Uh, we could call this the inherited treasures model of cultural evolution. It is, it is pretty much the prevailing wisdom in, in the humanities and the social sciences and in human culture generally. In other words, the culture is composed of good things, treasures, that were invented by innovators with insight, and then recognized and valued as such by adopters who transmit and tinker. In other words, what we have here is an economic model of possessions. These are the possessions of the culture, or of the people within that culture. There's one problem with this prevailing wisdom. Here are some, who are some treasures who invented words, or arithmetic, or music, or maps, or money? And the answer is nobody. Nobody invented these. It's not that we don't know who invented them, it's that nobody invented them. They evolved by natural selection. Not genetic natural selection, cultural natural selection. Just the way animals and plants and viruses do. It's important to remember viruses because by most people's definitions, viruses are not alive. They're just large macromolecules. They are, as I like to say, a string of nucleic acid with attitude. <laughs> they have this weird property that they provoke their own replication. And they travel light, they don't have their own copying machinery, they exploit the copying machinery of others, and they don't, again, remember, competence without comprehension, they have no clue what they're doing. If, if, if an amoeba is clueless, a virus is even more clueless, but they do have competence, stunning, evolved competence. You don't have to be alive to have competence. Natural selection can work on anything that replicates differentially that competes for space in the replication tournaments. Words are my favorite example of this. They are, I think, clearly the most important cultural items. Without words, human culture would be like chimpanzee culture, almost non-existent. We know that there are hundreds of thousands of words. Where do they all come from? Well, from thousands of languages, many of which are going extinct and will in another 50 years, we may only number the languages in the dozens or hundreds. Could they have had a common ancestor? Yeah, they could have. In fact, if this is the phylogenetic tree, the great tree of life, we also have glossogenetic trees, which are the, which are the trees, the lineages of languages. Here are the Proto-Indo-European languages, here are the Finno-Ugric languages, the languages of China, Proto-Mayan languages. I just went to websites and grabbed all these nice glossogenetic trees. 
to show you that a lot of work has been done to work out the, the genealogy, if you like, the, the, the lineages of languages. And some of this work was done long before Darwin. In fact, Darwin was himself somewhat inspired by work of 19th century uh, 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 students of, of language evolution. One of the problems we have in language is what we might call horizontal word transfer. Horizontal gene transfer is a big topic in evolutionary biology these days, and it means that genes are easier to track than lineages for many reasons. And the same thing is true, of course, with words, because there's a lot of switching or anastomosis between languages. Words in Norwegian which come from English, words in English that come from Inuit or from Spanish, even those languages parted company in the trees long ago. Words are more trackable items than whole languages. Well, in 1975, Richard Dawkins introduced the concept of memes in his famous book, The Selfish Gene, as cult cultural items analogous to genes or to viruses, differentially replicating things that evolution could be the true theory of, even though they didn't have proteins, even though they weren't alive. Now, memes has had a rocky history. A lot of people hate the idea, which is very different from dismissing it for good reasons. They just hate the idea, <laughs> including a lot of biologists, I've found. So I'm, part of my task these days is to get biologists to rethink their dislike of memes. Sometimes they'll say to me, well, I don't even know if memes really exist. And I say, do you think words exist? How many of you think words exist? How many of you are not sure that there are any words? <laughs> well, if you think words exist, then you think memes exist, because what words are, are memes that can be pronounced. Now, one of the points that is made always about evolution is that for evolution to occur, copying must be high fidelity, but not perfect. If it were perfect, there wouldn't be any mutation. So are there any means? Yes, as I say, means are words that can, words are means that can be pronounced, and they are copied, and they are they are literally descended. Every word in your vocabulary is descended from a word that you heard, or maybe several times when you were younger, which descended from other words, and we can go all the way back in principle on that. Now I want to show you just how high fidelity language is by showing you that it does something that genes do too, and that is, it's digitized. Now what do you see? You see the cat. But look more closely and you'll see that the H and the A are actually the same symbol, exactly the same shape. You automatically, competently, involuntarily, unconsciously, without comprehension of what you're doing, you correct. You correct to a norm, you use context to correct to a norm, and this is what preserves fidelity in written language. The same thing also occurs, though, in spoken language, and is more important. Writing is a very recent technical innovation, but, but language is much older and, and much more, uh, uh, spoken language, much more important for my story. So I want to demonstrate to you the digitization of language, spoken language by doing a little demonstration experiment. So, ready? I want you to listen very